Mr. President, welcome to Beyond's Global Leadership Series. Sir. Thank you so much for this opportunity. The pleasure is all mine. Let me start with uh, india colombia relations. How would you describe them today? I think that this relationship has grown over time. We have uh, 60 years of diplomatic relations, and uh, we now have uh, uh, two treaties that uh, promote investment, uh, double taxation and uh, protection of investment treaties. And we have been uh, trying to, to uh, get acquainted. Like in any relationship, you have to know each other. And therefore, we have been evolving. And I think we are at the best moment of our relations. I think there's a tremendous potential for the future. We have not uh, been able to um, really uh, get out of the potential we have, both countries. Mm -hmm. We have uh, differences and similarities and shared visions and shared interest in many aspects of what is happening in the world, in the economic aspect, in the social aspect. So I think uh, I would describe the relations as good uh, at the best moment, but with a tremendous potential to grow. Yes, and both are developing countries with uh, a lot of convergence and common interests. Uh, uh, what has the government here in Bogota uh, been doing? What steps have we been taking to promote uh, trade and investment, for instance, with India? Well, we have been uh, trying to diversify the uh, countries with which we have uh, trade and with which we have investment. And so we have a, a special office that has gone to India. My Minister of Foreign Affairs and my Minister of Trade were in India just a few months ago, uh, trying to uh, get uh, the investors in India interested in Colombia. You already have uh, investment in Colombia. They're doing w very well. I've, I've been with them and, they, and I al always ask them, how are you doing? And they say, excellent, because this is a, a market that is growing. Colombia is one of the uh, most successful economies of Latin America. We now have the Pacific Alliance with the three other countries, Mexico, Peru, and Chile. And these four countries uh, make up, uh, if you add them together, the eighth economy in the, in the world, uh, and are the economies in Latin America that are growing the fastest. Uh, and therefore, there is a tremendous potential uh, uh, the Indian tourism is also starting to come to Colombia. We want to attract uh, 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 tourism because this is one of the great potentials for Colombia. And so we're using the same uh, m traditional mechanisms uh, that uh, every country uses, India also, to promote our country and to pr promote trade. And from what I've seen of Bogota, I think it's a beautiful city. More and more people should visit, certainly. Uh, how do you see the programs and policies of the Indian Prime Minister, who's made it a personal mission to reach out to various countries in the world and to increase India's uh, collaboration and, and investments with them? I think your Prime Minister is a great leader, a great world leader, and also a visionary because his programs, for example, the, the education and uh, uh, the priority that he has given to the IT, the digital uh, area, is something that I have been trying to do here, mm -hmm. in that we coincide. Uh, education in Colombia is the number one uh, uh, investment and in, or expenditure in, in, our, uh, in our budget. Um, it has been there for four years. I think this is a great uh, investment for the future. IT. Uh, the digital world, the technology, we have been able to, to connect the whole country with fiber optic and broadband to give even the poorest people access to technology. Mm -hmm. And I think your Prime Minister is doing something very similar, so we share many of the views. Uh, the, the fight against poverty, uh, we have been trying to fight poverty, and my inspiration is uh, somebody from India who was my former teacher, uh, Amartya Sen, the, the Nobel uh, Economic Laureate. Uh, he has helped me put in place the multi-dimensional index to fight poverty, and that's why we have been the most successful country in the whole of Latin America in reducing poverty and reducing inequalities. And that 
uh, is uh, inspired by a great uh, uh, person who comes from India. Right. You mentioned the United Nations. Do you think it's time for uh, serious reform at the United Nations? And do you believe that it's become a cozy club of the P5 and Indian countries like yours should now find a place at the high table? Well, there's a discussion there. Um, India has a specific position that um, you want uh, uh, some specific countries to be permanent members like the P5. Uh, we have uh, another vision in that respect. Uh, we want more countries to be members of the Security Council, but not on a permanent basis. Um, I think we have some differences, but in, in the overall uh, approach, I think we coincide, which is uh, making the United Nations and the Security Council uh, more open, uh, that more countries can participate. Do you think the United Nations is still uh, a body that, that serves a purpose? The United Nations, yes. I think uh, the United Nations was created after the World War II to prevent wars. Um, it has made a, a tremendous effort to do that. Sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it fails. Um, everybody uh, uh, claims m more uh, work and more success, but many who claim more work and more success uh, don't uh, deliver when they ask them for money. Uh, but overall, I think the United Nations has played an important role in the world affairs and uh, with some reforms, uh, uh, we should continue to support the United Nations. Uh, you were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016. Describe for us your journey and your country's journey in, in achieving this peace deal. Well, it's a very um, difficult path, but very rewarding. We had an internal war for more than 50 years, 54 years. And ending a, a war of 54 years is difficult. Uh, leadership uh, to make war is easy. I had to make war when I was Minister of Defense. Mm. Um, and leadership to make peace is much more difficult. You have to change uh, um, the prejudices, the sentiments of the people, the way uh, the people see each other. Uh, you have to teach people to forgive, and that is much more difficult. But uh, we uh, went through this path, uh, breaking uh, bottlenecks and, uh, and uh, breaking obstacles, and we finally approached something that in Colombia eight years ago would seem impossible. We made, and I am proud to say, the impossible possible. We are now uh, living in peace. This is a new country. Uh, you go to many areas in Colombia that you had never been before because the war had not allowed that. The security situation did not allow it. And now we're Colombians are rediscovering and the world is rediscovering a new Colombia. Yes, the world is cheering this deal, but do you believe the Colombians have taken longer to accept it? Yes, because, um, because we lived through the war to accept, for example, the former guerrillas uh, to be members of Congress, many people uh, reject that. But this is a, a natural um, thing to, to feel. Uh, the victims, uh, some of them forgive, others don't forgive. Uh, this, is, this is a process. I say that we ended the war, the, the, the guns are now uh, silenced, now we have to construct peace. And that is done step by step. It's like, I say, building a cathedral, brick by brick. And we're in the process. I think we're going in the right direction. Of course, there are difficulties. Of course, you find uh, people who don't like it. But overall, this is the correct path. And uh, what you have to do when you are in government or in your life is do what you think is correct. Right. Many countries in this, the world in, in today's day and age are struggling with what Colombia struggled with and there are stalemates and there are negotiations which go nowhere. What are the lessons they can learn, including India, from your peace deal? Well, first that there is no conflict that is impossible to overcome uh, through dialogue, through understanding uh, and through perseverance. Uh, every con conflict should uh, be solved. People 
here in Colombia never thought eight years ago that what we did was possible. If you, the Poles said, uh, don't even try. This is impossible. Now we are living in a new world, in a new country. Uh, I think that you must uh, uh, create the conditions. Every conflict has its own particular conditions. In our case, uh, we needed to have the support of the region. We slowly but surely got that support. The international community, we got that support. The United Nations, the Security Council, we got that support. Uh, we, through conversations, uh, won the confidence, the trust of your counterpart. This is one of the very uh, most difficult aspects of any negotiation. Uh, that we, after some years, we were able to build that uh, minimum trust necessary to reach agreements and then uh, be realistic. Uh, uh, if both parts are, are realistic in accepting the position of the others, then solutions are, are possible. I think a big part uh, of, of it is also the fact that all parties wanted a resolution. And a lot of conflicts uh, fester because there are people in power who want them to fester and it is in their interest. Uh, another ultimate deal has been promised by the President of the United States in West Asia. Do you have any advice for him? Well, I'm not in no position to give advice to, <laughs> to the President of the United States. But uh, what I would say is that um, the, the world is our house of of the humanity. Uh, the human race lives in one house, it's called the world. Uh, and we are one race. And we should treat each other with respect. Uh, we should treat each other uh, accepting our differences. And uh, that is a way to live uh, comfortably and in peace in, in our house called the world. Uh, and I would say that uh, if the United States President wants to have good relations with the rest of the world, he must take into account the interest of the other parties, not his own interest only, because that's when you start having troubles. All right, spoken like a diplomat. Uh, how do you see the role of the United Nations in, uh, in the FARC deal and, and what has happened in terms of uh, reconciliation and rehabilitation? Well, many times the, you, United Nations is, is uh, stalled because the interest of the member, members of the Security Council diverge. And uh, you see how many times uh, the veto power has been used to, uh, to stop uh, the United Nations uh, intervening in one way or, or the other. That has been a handicap of, of the United Nations. I think the, the goodwill is always there. I know many people uh, uh, that are in the, in the bureaucracy of the United Nations that are, have a, a tremendous goodwill, but many times uh, the circumstances around the political realities don't allow them to do what they, they should and want to do. Let's talk about terrorism. How do you view the, po the, the threats posed by terrorism in this region and other parts of the world? Terrorism in Latin America, fortunately, has uh, almost disappeared, but there's always, there's always uh, the danger that it can come back. Terrorism is very easy to, to do. Um, you just have to uh, get a few people and uh, they can create terror w whenever they want, and when that is used as a political weapon, it becomes extremely difficult to, uh, to fight. Uh, we have, in Colombia, had a very, very long experience of fighting terrorism. Um, terrorism done by drug traffickers, terrorism done by the guerrillas, um, and uh, we have learned uh, how to fight it. We, we need uh, to be conscious that international cooperation against terrorism is necessary. Uh, we need to, uh, to understand that no country should should protect uh, terrorists uh, and uh, whatever country that in some way protects terrorism uh, should be isolated from the world uh, uh, political arena. I think terrorism is a tremendous, uh, uh, causes a tremendous 
uh, havoc to, to humanity, and the more we fight it, the better off we are. How do you see the interventions of the United States in, uh, in South America? Well, fortunately, the, the United States is uh, not intervening in, in, in South America because uh, we have uh, a tradition of not uh, liking or rejecting uh, these type of interventions. Uh, in the case of uh, the United States, for example, wanting to uh, or talking about invasion of Venezuela, uh, we are against that, even though we want a change uh, of regime in Venezuela, because there we have uh, sp uh, sponsors of, of uh, violators of human rights, and uh, the Venezuelan situation is completely unacceptable from any view that uh, you analyze this problem. The, the people are dying of hunger. Uh, people are dying because they don't have medicine, and uh, it's one of the richest countries in Latin America. The biggest oil reserves of the whole world are in Venezuela. But uh, nevertheless, we don't want the United States to uh, invade Venezuela. Uh, this should be a problem that the Venezuelans should solve, and we, want, we, we should like to help them. Uh, we want to help them by diplomatic pressure. But President Maduro accuses Colombia and Mexico of colluding with Washington uh, to, to overthrow his regime. Well, President Maduro uh, says many things that are not true. Um, Mexico, Colombia, and the whole of Latin America want democracy to be restored in Venezuela. Uh, Maduro has destroyed uh, all the democratic institutions. It has uh, violated every human right uh, for their population, and this is a situation that is not acceptable to anybody who has uh, any sensibility for human rights and uh, freedom. And it, it has a direct impact on your country. Some estimates say that up to two million Venezuelans uh, without proper permits and legal papers are living uh, in, in Colombia right now. We have a bit, a bit over one million. It's a tremendous problem. We have given them a, a generous uh, reception. Um, we, we think we have this obligation, uh, but it's a big problem, Pro probably the most uh, severe problem that we have right now, Colombia, is immigration from Venezuela uh, because the pressure on our health system and our education system is tremendous. This is a big problem for us. Do you think Colombia is also sending out a message and a uh, for, for other countries, rich European nations are turning away boatfuls of asylum seekers. Uh, the United States is practicing a policy of zero tolerance. And here is a developing nation that is opening its doors and its hearts to people who want to come and make a new life. Well, this is a big contrast. Uh, when Colombia is, giving, is opening our, our borders to people who are wanting to, to have a better life in Colombia, and uh, other countries are rejecting immigration. Uh, this is an unfortunate situation. Um, the best, the best uh, immigration policy that the United States can have uh, in the region is to help the developing countries that are south of, the, of its border to have more opportunities. Uh, not by building walls, but by making uh, these countries uh, stronger economically and uh, socially because that's the way that the people will stay in those countries. Let's talk about a problem that Colombia has faced for very many years. It's the drug problem. What has your government done and what is it doing right now to resolve it? This is a, a problem that the world uh, has to deal with. Uh, Colombia, of course, because it's for us a matter of national security. Uh, the world declared the war on drugs 45 years ago and uh, this is a war that has not been won. And a war that has not been won after 45 years is a war that you lost. So we have to um, accept that we lost this war and that we have to uh, find new approaches, new alternatives. The approach of simply putting in jail every uh, person in the chain of drug trafficking um, simply does not work. It has not worked. So we need a more effective approach. The consuming, the consumers should not be um, 
uh, uh, singled out as criminals. Uh, this is a, a health problem. The peasants who grow the coca or the marijuana, uh, they're victims. You go after the mafias, the intermediaries, you go after them by uh, a hard, uh, hard line uh, policy and uh, you find alternatives to the produ producers and to the consumers. As a former journalist, I have to ask you this question. How do you, f how do you see the relationship of governments with the press now? And how do you see attempts by some to discredit the press uh, every time there's a story that doesn't suit a government, they call it fake news? Well, I have been a defender of the freedom of the press all my life because I was a journalist. I won the King of Spain Prize in Journalism and I was chair, chairman of the uh, Freedom of the, for the Press Committee of the Inter-American Press Society. So I, I have this in my heart. Um, the freedom of the press for me is a sacred uh, uh, condition for any democratic country, for our own liberties. I, I uh, concur with uh, Thomas Jefferson when he included the First Amendment in the United States Constitution. Uh, governments don't like criticisms. Um, I, here in Colombia, encourage criticism because I, I think I, I say it was like a, a cold shower in the morning that wakes you up and, and reality is different from many times what you want to see. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, therefore, I'm a tremendous defender of, of the freedom of the press. Unfortunately, this uh, uh, fake news and the, uh, what has happened with the social media it's affecting the press because uh, the, the, the people who don't like uh, criticism is now putting the press in an in a awkward position of blaming them for what is happening around the social media and the criticism. And this is uh, something which is not uh, healthy for, for the uh, liberties of, of societies and, and democracies. But we have to uh, live with it, uh, and not by uh, censoring the press or censoring uh, the freedom of expression, but by trying to persuade to have a better, better uh, way of dealing with social media and criticism in a democracy, because in the, the dictatorship, this is not a problem. Right. My final question to you. You've, you've been a journalist, then you've run a newspaper. You've been a defense minister, then you've run a country. You won the Nobel Prize. What next for you? Well, uh, I want to uh, uh, take some time. I want to be a professor for some, for some time. I want to uh, write. I've been a journalist, but I have not had uh, time to write uh, my experiences I've had. I want to take uh, uh, some time with my family. I'm, I uh, have a first granddaughter. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, care of, uh, take care of her and uh, enjoy life a little bit. And of course, the Nobel Prize uh, uh, generates many demands. Uh, Amartya Sen uh, uh, has invited me to become a, like a, a, a partner in his uh, Institute for Human Development. Uh, I might accept that because uh, fighting poverty is something that I like. and something that, uh, that I have learned uh, to value and uh, have put in place some very progressive and audacious policies is uh, uh, the environment, protecting our environment. Uh, I really am worried what is happening to the world, climate change, and I think there we have to uh, do some, uh, some better and more work. That sounds like a lot of work to me. It's not my definition of taking time off. It was a pleasure talking to you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you.